Medieval castles had many defenses to keep out foreign invaders and protect its citizens. And just like the castles of old, our dairy farms need defenses too, for the health of our cows, the health of the consumer, and health of our pocketbooks. Hi, I'm Ted, and I'm here to talk to you about keeping our farms and cows safe from infectious diseases, the kind we hope we never see, like foot and mouth disease, and the kind that we might see, like tuberculosis and salmonella, BVD, brucellosis, and many others. The last thing I want to live through is a full-blown epidemic affecting the entire region. I know from past epidemics there have been isolated farms by luck or by design that were not affected. I want my farm to be one of those, and I'm willing to find out what it takes. Did you know that many of the things that we can do to prevent the spread of foreign animal diseases can also help prevent the more common diseases from entering our herds and farms? In the next several minutes, we'll talk about the important defenses we could put in place in order to keep our herds healthy, to protect our products, and to protect the market. I've asked my vet to help out, and here she is. Let's use my castle, well, I mean my farm, as an example to see just how vulnerable my operation might be. Well, Ted, there's two general types of preventive measures that we can put into place to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. The first is to prevent diseases from entering the farm from the outside. And the second is to prevent the spread of disease within the farm. Let's focus first on those outer defenses. The first thing you notice when you approach a castle is its location. Often sited on a hill, the location provides powerful protection to the entire structure from enemy invasions. How does this translate to the dairy? We might not be able to build on a hill, but if we were building a new dairy, we might consider grouping the animal housing more towards the center of our property. Some dairies have been built this way already. It makes sure that your cattle don't share fence lines with your neighbor's cattle or are easily accessible from the road. Well, my farm was not built with the animal housing in the center, so what can I do? Well, castles had moats and high walls to keep invaders out. With perimeter fences, not only could you keep people from wandering onto the farm, but you could keep out dogs that can play havoc with your calves and reduce the theft of your calves, heifers, or equipment. Well, you're right about that. With the price of heifers, I don't want anyone to be able to easily come onto my farm and take calves. And I've had dogs injure and kill calves in the past. I also remember that dogs have been responsible for the spread of brucellosis between farms. Perimeter fences sound like a pretty good idea. What else should we be considering? Well, in addition to the moat, castles had a drawbridge to restrict access. Although we won't be digging ditches around your farm, we could have a single point of entry that would restrict visitors to one particular location on the farm, away from the animals in the bulk tank, like the farm office. Having one main entrance to a farm makes this much easier. Some people have even installed locked gates, a call box, and a keypad entry to restrict people from entering the farm. You know in the movies when they say halt who goes there? It makes sense for us to ask the same question on the farm. Some producers are keeping visitor logs, which includes feed company reps, the nutritionist, feed or drug delivery trucks. And foot trimmers, veterinarians, cattle haulers, the rendering truck. And don't forget workmen like the electricians or milking equipment people and other people that might drive onto the farm. If you're going to have visitors, some producers provide protective clothing like boots and coveralls that are worn only on their dairy. Well, that makes sense. That's a good idea. All right, so if we look at my farm, I can see a number of places where people can enter and, and maybe bring something in with them. And if we take a look at traffic on a dairy, you can see how complex the traffic flow really is. What is carried onto the farm by cars and trucks that I need to worry about? Contaminated vehicles can actually bring in and deposit bacteria and viruses onto your farm. In a study done during the 2001 foot and mouth outbreak in the UK, they found that if a farm had separate animal and vehicle traffic, they reduced their chance of foot and mouth disease by almost five times. Providing clear signs can help route the traffic to the right entrance. If you can limit traffic to non-animal areas, you can reduce your risk of spreading diseases carried by the trucks and by the people. Another practice that should be prevented is any offloading of animals onto your farm when a cattle hauler is picking up some of your cattle. And cattle you're having picked up should be brought to the perimeter of your place so that no one drives into the center of your farm with a load of someone else's cattle. The rendering truck should have access only to the periphery of the farm so as not to contaminate your property with anything that might be in that truck. I think we can make some simple changes to our vehicle traffic flow. 
and we can limit the delivery and service vehicles to the outer edges of the farm. But what about you, my veterinarian, and the breeder, and the foot trimmer? They need access to the cows and their equipment while working on the farm. For the foot trimmer, you could provide a working site where you could move the cattle to him and he doesn't have to drive into the middle of your farm. Or you could provide on-farm transportation and clean clothing and maybe even a boot wash. You should be the person that sets the pattern of how vehicles enter your farm, and in effect, when you lower the drawbridge. Well, how can I be sure that vehicles are not bringing diseases in with them? Trucker tire washing is required in the poultry and swine industries. Mm -hmm. You need to decide how much risk you are willing to take. The idea is to limit the risk of contamination from other animals as much as we can. One of my security concerns has always been access to the milk house and the bulk tank. One contaminated load of milk with antibiotics or chemicals can cost me a bundle, can cost my creamery money, and could damage my industry's reputation. Think of your milk house as the castle keeper tower. That was the best fortified place in the castle. Your milk house and bulk tank hold the farm's most precious commodity next to the cows. Because of the potential contamination of the bulk tank from a disgruntled worker or someone else, many producers have gone to putting a lock in their bulk tank or have some means to limit access to it. The safety and security of the milk supply starts here on the farm. So the external defenses include fences, gates, traffic control, and milk house access. What about the internal defenses, the things that will prevent the spread of diseases within my farm? The first thing to think about is if you buy any animals or move animals on and off the farm, like heifers and bulls, you run the risk of introducing new diseases or new strains of diseases. Well, I do buy bulls occasionally, and the heifer calves go to a calf ranch and come back. Movement of heifers, bulls, and show cattle back onto the farm also present risks for introducing new diseases to the herd. There are many sources of outside cattle. You could buy bulls, springers, and get cattle at the sales yard. Do you really know a lot about those animals you're buying? Like the legendary Trojan horse, you could have bought a bull or a heifer with footworts, yonis, salmonella, BVD, or something worse. You need to know the disease status of the herd those animals came from. What about isolating them when they come back onto my farm? A standard recommendation is that any animal that comes onto your farm should be isolated or quarantined for up to three weeks. It should be in a spot to which other animals don't have access, at least 100 yards from other cattle. The issue is that cattle can be incubating a disease and not showing any signs. Isolation gives them the time to become sick with an acute disease if they're going to. It's also a great time to test these animals for disease. We could do ear notches for BVD or milk cultures for mycoplasma or Staph aureus mastitis and take a look at any sick animals. Another benefit of isolation is that you can get them used to your feeds before putting them in with the rest of the herd. To further prevent the spread of diseases through the herd, we should also limit different cattle groups' access to each other. For example, young stock should be kept far away from adult cows. And if we're going to handle the young stock, that should be done before we work with the older animals. Or you might have workers that are restricted to just working with the calves, have changes of clothes between cows and calves, and also boot wash facilities. To prevent many diseases like yonis and salmonella, we need to make sure that the young stock never have access to adult cow manure. So when it comes to older cattle, we don't want to group the fresh cows next to the hospital cows because fresh cows are most susceptible to infectious diseases. For example, most mycoplasma mastitis outbreaks occur because of exposure in the hospital pen. And we should try to minimize any opportunities for the contamination of the feed bunks or water troughs with manure. One thing we do here is clean the loader if we're going to use it to haul manure and then feed. It'd be great if we had a separate loader just for feed, but we don't. Another thing I think is important is to monitor my feed. Over 50% of my farm costs are related to feed expenses. So I'd like to be able to keep track of my inventory and prevent spoilage and shrink by storing it properly. And we also have a bird and rodent control program on my farm. Also, keeping feed tags or the invoices is important in case there's a problem. Accidental contamination of your cattle feed can affect the health of your cows and maybe your ability to sell milk and market cattle. There's one very important farm security measure that we haven't talked about yet, and that's training your employees. 
Employees on your farm are important members of the farm security team. They should understand the importance of and comply with your visitor and farm traffic plan. They should have enough training so they can help in the defense against disease introduction. We're already doing that. They know who to call in case of sick cows or something unusual happening on the farm. They also know what to do if there are strangers on the farm. And now you'll have to tell them what your plan is for limiting disease spread. <laughs> exactly. I'll need to train them in all the things I've learned today. Basically, they need to know why your plan is important and why they are important in helping you implement it. We know we can't have zero risk of disease introduction, but we can certainly minimize the risk, reduce theft on the farm, reduce our chances of spreading diseases, and diminish the possibility of chemical or biological contamination of feed, cattle, and milk. Each additional protection helps reduce our risk. And even if you had a foreign animal disease introduced into your herd, we need to have things in place to reduce spread to the rest of the industry. If a disease is introduced into your neighbor's herd, these are the same things you can do to protect your farm.